Hey guys, Brock here. The following was a joint podcast between the RCE crew and the Food Fight Show, which is a podcast that focuses on people who use Chef. The first half of the show is going to be us kind of talking with them to explain kind of what the needs of the HPC community are, uh, from my view as an admin and from Jeff's view as a developer. And then the second half, we get into details of what Chef are for us and our listeners to understand. So hope you enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Food Fight Show. I am your co-host, Nathan Harvey. With me today, as usual, my co-host, Brian Barry. Brian, how are you today? Oh, Brian, the mute button. Don't forget the mute button. we typing. <laughs> so, uh, I'm coming to you today from Annapolis, Maryland, where it is sunny and beautiful. Brian is coming to us today from Rome, Italy, where it is... Uh, mute and quiet. Uh, so maybe Brian will uh, fix his audio issues here in just a moment. But while he does, I wanted to share some uh, some information for you, some chef news. Actually, it's not necessarily chef news, but those of you that are listening, um, if you're listening to the Food Fight Show, I bet you're, you have something to say about DevOps uh, or system administration, things like this. We have some great conferences coming up where you should submit talks to, uh, or you should at least plan on going to these conferences. So one talk, uh, or there are a bunch of uh, conferences coming up around DevOps days. A lot of them have CFPs that are closing very, very soon, so get your talks submitted as soon as you can. Those uh, DevOps days that have CFPs closing soon include India, London, and Portland, probably a couple of other locations as well. Check the devopsdays.org site. Uh, also, CloudStack Collaboration Conference in Europe has an open CFP that's going to be closing soon. So if you're doing some stuff with CloudStack, maybe that's worth checking out. Brian, can we hear you yet? Yes, we can. And All uh, right. what I'm the CFP for one of my favorite conferences is coming up. That is the Free and Open Source Developers Meeting for Europe. Uh, and that's in Brussels, I believe, February 1st and 2nd. Awesome. Um, the uh, call for proposals is due for the main track, I believe, October 1st. Yes. And, for the, and I believe uh, the call for the dev rooms to organize a dev room is on October 15th. Is that correct, Nathan? Uh, that sounds about right. Uh, the dev rooms, uh, I know there are always lots of dev rooms that are a lot of fun. Brian, you and I participated in a dev room last year, right? Oh, we did. It was, uh, it was crazy fun. Um, yeah. And uh, it's, it's just neat because when you go to U.S. conferences, they're fun. You get people from all over the U.S., but you get an even much wider spectrum of people in Brussels. Yeah, it was uh, the, the thing about Fostum that I remember most is it was huge. Oh my gosh, it's so, so big. Uh, but then the other thing that was cool was the config management room. It was overflowing uh, the entire time. Uh, that's both cool and sad because it meant some people couldn't come in and hang out with us and talk about config management. But uh, a couple of folks uh, have come up with a solution for that this year. You know what I'm talking I, about, Brian? I, I don't. Oh, yes, I do know. I do know. And that is config management camp uh, organized by our good friend, Chris Beitert, that will... Uh, be immediately after uh, FOSTEM for two days. So uh, you can get a little bit of configuration management in at, uh, at FOSTEM, but then follow on for two whole days. Uh, what I, I like about this is that last year, Chris did, uh, he's been doing puppet camps, uh, which is great, but I think he noticed, as many of I, us have also noticed, that whether it's puppet or chef, we're solving a lot of the same problems, and it makes sense to have a broader, a broader topic. Absolutely, and so, uh, yeah, I'm working with Chris uh, and a bunch of other folks to help organize this config management camp that's going to be the two days after Fostum. I think maybe we should have Chris come on the show and talk a little oh. bit about it uh, here in, in the next episode or two. What do you think? Oh, definitely. I agree. Yeah. I also think that for a lot of Americans, you may feel like it's a long trek, but I think it's a really great opportunity to come to Europe and, uh, and, and see and do something technical, but at the same time, see, you know, go to a new place and meet some new people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And drink some fantastic beer. It's <laughs> good enough for me. <laughs> All right, so enough of uh, conferences. We're here to talk about Chef and HPC today. So we've got, uh, actually this whole show I think kind of spawned out of an email that came onto the Chef Dev list uh, from a couple of guys over at the RCE cast. 
Uh, and so I'd like to welcome today, uh, well, we'll start with you, Brock. Brock, welcome to the show. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, forgive me, I'm still recovering from a little bit of an illness here, so I may sound a little funny. Um, but just to introduce myself, I am Brock Palin, and I am one half of RCE Cast, and the other half is going to speak here in a minute and correct everything I say that is wrong. But uh, RCE stands for Research Computing and Engineering. Um, I personally reside at the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan. I am both an alumni, a student employee, and now a full-time employee there, where I am one of the admins for the High Performance Computing Group. Um, had this idea to start a podcast, which became RCE Cast, which is rce-cast.com, um, where we just like to explore and find out other things that are going on in our, it's a relatively small community, but there's a big split between science and, um, you could say, like, uh, administrators, and we like to kind of keep track of everything that's going on in terms of best practices and what new things are going on out there. Excellent. And uh, Jeff, introduce yourself. Uh, hi, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I'm first time Google Hangouts user, so hopefully I'm doing this right here. Um, my name is Jeff Squires. I, uh, I used to be the MPI guy at Cisco. MPI is kind of the the lingua fracta of what's used in these high-performance computing codes. It's, it's middleware library that stands for the message passing interface, but now I'm actually one of the MPI guys at Cisco. We have tripled in size, so there are three of us here. So it's actually really cool to be working with a bunch of uh, other MPI guys here at Cisco. But Brock um, kind of came up with the idea for this RCE cast several years ago. It's, I, I think he hit most of the, 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 the high points there. The, the idea is that as a system administrator, Brock gets exposed to different things than I get exposed to, because I'm a developer. Um, and I develop the tools that, that people use, but I'm not a user. And so there's at least these three different communities that we kind of try to bring together, that we talk to different administrators, we talk to different high-performance computing projects, we talk to developers, and try to just kind of make sure that everybody knows about some of these cool new things that are coming that people aren't necessarily aware of. And so we just, basically what it comes down to is we find cool people and talk about cool topics. And sometimes it's not directly related to HPC, but the infrastructure around HPC, which is how we got uh, uh, turned on to Chef, and that's how we reached out to you guys. Great, great. We also have Ben, Ben Cotton, my, my colleague, and I think Condor in Chief at uh, Cycle Computing. Ben, can you introduce yourself? I'm Ben Cotton, and like Brian said, I'm the uh, the resident Condor expert, or I should say HT Condor um, at Cycle Computing, and I previously worked at Purdue University in the research systems group, uh, I guess Brock's counterpart at a better Big Ten institution. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we get to fight today on the Food Fight Show. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I brought fight, my knife, fight. so. <laughs> you guys can uh, argue over obscure American sports. <laughs> Go Irish? Can I throw that one in? No. <laughs> <laughs> no idea what you guys are talking about. <laughs> On the HPC. Oh, and, and we have as well uh, the, the wonderful Matt Ray, a uh, longtime contributor. Great to have you here, Matt. Uh, and also representing uh, the University of Texas uh, with our. Uh, I actually got to work on, uh, uh, I think it was Ranger at the time, which is uh, the HPC cluster here uh, at UT. Uh, I actually work for Opscode, though, and haven't done any HPC stuff in like 10, 15 years. But uh, uh, I do work with a lot of people with some very large deployments, and uh, hopefully I have something useful to uh, add to the conversation. Yeah, and I think uh, before we get on, um, you know, this year the University of Maryland, where I'm an alumni, uh, bought their way. I mean, I uh, moved into the Big Ten, uh, <laughs> so I have to come and represent. Go Terps. <laughs> You're talking right. about the Big Ten of supercomputers, right? Uh, right, the Big Ten of supercomputers. Absolutely. Yeah, and football. Uh, <laughs> so that we keep using this word HPC, what does it mean? Brock, can uh, you define HPC for us? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll start and everyone can fill in the holes I miss. Um, so HPC, it, it depends w what you want it to be. The most common case we see is things that are horsepower bound. Um, scientific applications or business applications, we're seeing more business applications um, that are limited by the amount of horsepower either in a single system or just that sort of thing. So uh, we tend to have large stacks of machines. I have about 1,500 
nodes here at Michigan, and we're actually a relatively small deployment. Uh, Purdue installs that every year, um, and we do that every four years. And then places like you know uh, UT, they have these gigantic national lab setups where they've got some of the largest machines in the world with over a hundred thousand processor type systems and things like that. So th that's the traditional <laughs> that that's the traditional type system where you have a, a lot of CPU horsepower. Um, and then it's kind of interesting, um, you know, with uh, a Condor guy here is there's also these high throughput computing things that I, I, I'd like to include those guys in high performance computing. They're the large scale serial job farm. They're the need to get a lot of small tasks done quickly as opposed to a large single coupled task. Um, so there's no parallelism in the sense that you need an MPI library for communicating between nodes, but you have this need to maybe run a million, say you have a million little images of the sky from a telescope and you want to run a little analysis thing on them, you could farm those out on something like Open Science Grid or the Purdue Condor Pool uh, using what we call high throughput computing, but that's still very tightly and dear to us in the traditional high performance computing. And then there's people who just need more memory. I mean, I've got machines with a terabyte of RAM through Exceed. I get people on machines with 30 terabytes of RAM in a single system image. I mean, most people are happy if their server has 128 gigs or 512 gig, and we're, you know, we have people yelling at me that it's like, a terabyte's not enough of system memory. Um, and I tell them just parallelize their code and use multiple nodes. But uh, so this this is generally the case of CPU horsepower, memory horsepower, throughput horsepower. Just if it's bigger and you can't do enough, come and talk to us, and we've got a way to get it done. Interesting. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, so so what distinguishes you know traditional HPC from something like Hadoop? Uh, okay, so traditional HPC is what I would consider CPU bound. Hadoop is what I would consider data bound. Uh, normally, we, we have a small Hadoop setup here. We're exploring more for people who have data intensive applications. There's two fundamental ways. On a traditional HPC cluster, you have a batch queue where people submit work, and when resources become free, we run the application there on that resource, and we move data from a file system to where it's running. Hadoop takes the opposite approach. The data are already distributed on all the compute nodes, and we move computation to where the data are because okay. moving to computation is the cheaper thing. So data intensive as opposed to computationally intensive. So this is a, actually, I, I want to dig into this a little bit. Are there, are there HPC systems now that are more and more doing things like Hadoop that is moving the computation to the data? Uh, it seems like it would be quite an expensive task to always move... Well, I would say that the, the lines are becoming pretty blurred here, actually. So, right, I, I think uh, Brock's analogy of there of moving the compute to the data or moving the data to the compute, um, these are the, well, moving the data to the compute has been the way that people have been doing it for 30 years, right? That's the HPC way. The Hadoop way is only a couple of years old, and it kind of started with this idea of I have so much data that I can't move it and therefore I want to bring my compute to the, the data rather than the other way around. But uh, the Hadoop community is, is still fairly immature. Um, they're starting to realize that like, oh yes, now we can do these problems that we couldn't do before, but they're starting to realize, you know, they don't actually perform that well. So, you know, yeah, I can do it, but it takes a week to compute it. And that's better than not being able to do it at all, but really, I'd rather be able to do that in about an hour or two. And so there are some interesting researchy and uh, industry kind of experiments going on right now of seeing what, what can we blend between the two. Um, what can we learn from the HPC community and apply that to big data kinds of things? And what kind of big data techniques that have come out of the last couple of years can we apply to HPC? So. I don't think there's a, an interesting thing to say or a definitive thing that can be said about, you know, what is, uh, what big data stuff have we done because we don't know yet. Everybody's still exploring. That's a weasel answer, but it reflects reality at least. All right. I just want to put it out there that the biggest pain in my ass in dealing with HPC systems is NFS. <laughs> I just want to say that just to put that out, but we'll continue the conversation. <laughs> I, I can give you some things that are common in the HPC world that are will make NFS seem like a cakewalk. So. 
but but we use them for a reason. There, there's actually a lot of things. If you want to talk about infrastructure of what an HPC infrastructure looks like, a traditional one, there's a lot of things we use that are weird. That your your, your general IT shop, even a large scale like web shop that may have you know something that looks like a compute cluster, that we have that we won't have. We'll have these parallel file systems, Luster, Gluster, PanFS, GPFS. That I can write a a single namespace a gigabyte a second. Um, or a, a DVD a second, about five gigabytes a second, and my Luster file system is very small. Uh, Matt mentioned that you worked on Ranger. Ranger had this very large Luster file system that was doing you know tens of gigabytes a second, and now we have the Sequoia file system, which is 40 petabytes, single namespace, one terabyte per second. And this is completely outside the scope of any type of... And this is a POSIX file system, right? This is not an object store. This is... This is a POSIX file system, which is this is really weird and odd. And then we oh, get into these weird networks. <laughs> POSIX. <laughs> so like POSIX, well, actually, yeah. 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 With the, with the, you know, the world that Hadoop grew up in, the big prevailing assumption with Hadoop was that the network was crap, right? And and that is not necessarily true anymore. There, the Hadoop way was let's just write everything to disk because that's universal. And whether that's a, a network file system or a local file, it was almost always local file system, but they even used it to cross between nodes uh, sometimes, but that's just not the, the a correct assumption anymore. And so if you look at the HPC type of way, we assume that the network is awesome and do things at the expense of the network because we have super low latency and super high bandwidth. And so that's what I was talking about of the of the meshing of the two ideas and where where are we going to fall within that? I don't, I don't really know, but just thought that was a point to bring out there. Yeah, Jeff's been working on some really interesting stuff with the Cisco gear. Um, my local cluster, the one that has my, my best network, is, uh, is uh, 14,000 processors on a 40 gigabit per second InfiniBand network. So every node has a 40 gig. Now, it's not 40 gig for data. It's like 32, 32. gig for data. Yeah, but um, so that's still... pointing out anything, but, you know, it's yeah. only 32. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're still looking at 3 gigabyte per second capacity approximately for every server. And I've got, you know, fourteen thousand cores all on that network, and these aren't the uplinks. I mean, these are these are host level connections that are, you know, three times faster than ten gig e that most places still only use for uplinks. Mm -hmm. And this same network, it's you know, sub ten microsecond latency, and we do direct memory access over a network. There's a lot of weird things we do in the network, and the, the assumption that the network is awesome in HPC is totally true. Mm -hmm. um, and this By is the way, why you we say need sub network. 10 micro latency. That's a half round trip ping pong through the core. Right? Yeah. So that's it's that's actually less than five. In fact, <laughs> depending on what you're doing, it's uh, it gets all over the place. So it's sub 10 is is the safer thing, and people will quote you a sub two and things like that. But I mean, we're you're talking really significant latency differences here and performance and everything else. So this is some of the things we do that are different. Some of the things that we do are different. Interesting. So our, it sounds like most of the people that you talk to on your podcast are using their own hardware rather than the cloud? Uh, right now, yes. Um, but we're seeing more of that. Um, we see it more for things like your HTC type work because of the network and the cloud not always being deterministic or reliable or performant, honestly. Yeah. so there, there, There's a lot of fear of virtualization. Uh, because virtualization right. steals performance, right? So right off the top, you're going to lose. I'm going to make up a number, and I'll probably make all the virtualization people angry at me. But let's say you lose five to ten, five to ten percent of your performance CPU wise, and uh, at least another five to ten percent off your network performance, just because of the nature of how virtualization works. And traditionally, HPC shops have been all about the cycles, right? I want to get the maximum performance that I can. I run my HPC servers at 100%. We don't have idle time. So the assumptions that many people make about virtualization don't really hold for HPC, where you're, you're taking advantage of all that idle time on the server to run you know, a different VM and things like that. That is just not, uh, not what we do in HPC. All these codes are designed to use all the cores, lots and lots of memory, and 100% of, of the CPU. Now, that being said, some people are exploring the use of virtualization because they want to do things like, oh, my code runs in Red Hat 6, your code runs in Slash whatever, your code runs in Ubuntu, whatever. And so I want to give you your custom setup 
Um, and virtualization is a, a convenient vehicle to do that sometimes. But it's got this baggage that not everybody has really figured out how to really tweak the performance when you're running at 100% yet. Yeah, and I think the interconnect speed is really kind of the big issue. You know, it's hard to find somebody who's going to offer you 32 gigabit reliably in the cloud at this point. Yeah. I, I have no doubt that that's coming. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a variety of vendors who would love that kind of business and a lot of CIOs who would like to move the data center into somebody else's hands. But for the time being, if, you're, if your code is interconnect bound, then the cloud just isn't an option a lot of times. And also getting your data to the cloud, right? So a lot of these HPC codes have petabytes worth of data that they need to chunk on. And so you might be down to the, you know, the traditional analogy of dump a bunch of tapes or DVDs into a station wagon or FedEx and drive it to the cloud, and that's faster. Yeah. So, well, there's, uh, uh, there's, Amazon has it as a service, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there's a couple of things. I can tell you at Michigan, we're actually working with Amazon and are trying to make that an option, but mostly for excess capacity. Uh, two things. HPC systems, especially the larger ones, have always had some sort of batch queue system, which really kind of makes the HPC system look like like some sort of like private uh, service cloud that provides a single service of we provide compilers and Red Hat's five or six and you just go and so like the service I run here um, researchers can come and lease CPU time from us on a monthly basis and so they get the InfiniBand network, the, the high performance latency network, they get our software library, they get our Lustre file system, they get expertise in terms of you know things a lot like what cycle computing provides to you know people who want to you know, use Amazon specifically or some other cloud provider. And I have over 100 unique research projects, 500 unique users a month, and this lets me smooth out my usage. So my local system looks a lot like a private cloud. And we've already hit certain economies of scale because we get academic pricing and things like that. Now, that doesn't necessarily apply in the business space. But we can look a lot like a cloud that provides a single service. Yeah, and that's a good point. I mean, from the, from the standpoint of an individual researcher, you know, the the days of having your own cluster tucked up in a corner of your lab somewhere, I mean, that's just not manageable when you can have a central, you know, university or business or, you know, whatever infrastructure that, you know, where you can sh share resources because not everybody's going to be hitting the cluster at the same time. Right. right. But I still have the problem every now and then where even though I have, um, you know, you know, this into five digits in terms of processor cores. I have a research group that likes to show up and use us for burst capacity and they want to use us for burst capacity at 2,000 cores at a whack and that's a significant percentage of my system that I can't necessarily always provide that. Um, most of the time I can um, but sometimes it'd be nice to be able to just let a couple hundred cores trickle out to Amazon and extend our network out to them because they are doing serial processing. They don't need the high performance network. Well, actually they do because they're a genomic shop and they're moving large quantities of data. But um, if I could only trickle a couple hundred data assists. Right, right. So, so I, I could, what I feel like is a weak link in the, the current um, current setup that you uh, you're describing is probably yourself. That is, it's in a, it's a very competitive job market that we see in the in the DevOps world, and I would think it'd be very hard for universities to pay and retain. Uh, really talented administrators. Well, you'll notice I'm not at Purdue anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, but that's that's a problem. I mean, you know, universities, and you know, I'm trying to speak too broadly, but um, you know, they have certain benefits that they offer that the private sector can't. You know, tuition discounts or you know, stability or whatever. But you know, when when you're, if you add a, if you add a couple zeros, are those, those those are overwhelmed. Yeah, but you know, on, on the one hand, if you have an offer from you know a, a national center out in, in California or you know a university in the Midwest, and one of them's paying you twice as much and is a you know a much more exciting geographic location, you know, I think the, the job market is it's definitely a uh, it, it favors the practitioner more than the employer for HPC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it quickly gets into calculus, just like there is with, with any job kind of figuring out what you're doing, right? I mean, 
the cost of living too at the University of Michigan, I'll wager, is significantly lower than living in Silicon Valley, for example. Um, and so, you know, there there's a lot of a lot of data points. But I, I will say too that there is a dearth of qualified HPC system administrators, right? So Brock is among the few. The typical way that things are done is that uh, you know, random chemistry professor is like, oh, I need a 32 node cluster to run my my codes. So they get a bunch of funding, they buy a bunch of stuff, and then they say, hey, you graduate student, go run my cluster. And you get a cluster that, you know, kind of sort of works on Tuesdays. Um, and, and finding somebody qualified to run that and keep it running, it's, you know, as you DevOps guys know, it's a complicated job. And even though in some cases they run very well by themselves, every machine needs care and feeding and someone who actually knows what they're doing. So, yeah, Brock, you're a rare guy. <laughs> well, I can tell you though, like my background, my um, I was a student here in the engineering school. Um, my background is nuclear engineering. I'm a scientist type thing. Um, and this was a summer job for me. I was swapping dead fans and processors on a 32-bit AMD cluster, which at the time was in the top 500 with only 105 nodes. And now I've got over a thousand, and I can't scratch the list. You're I mean, gonna have to growing define space. what top 500 is there, bro. Oh, okay. <laughs> top 500. Uh, top 500.org, and that's 500. Um, it's the there's a standard benchmark for HPC systems that all you can get into a gigantic religious fight about how valid the benchmark is, but um, it's a top 500 publicly acknowledged, because I know some that are not on that list that would be on that list, um, HPC platforms in the world. And, and the interesting thing is some of them aren't HPC platforms. You'll go on the list and you'll, say, you'll see unnamed internet services company. I doubt that's actually a traditional HPC system. I bet you that's just a cloud platform that they decided to run the benchmark on real quick. Um, yeah. yeah, but it's, it's it's interesting. But yeah, it, I mean, it does I give was an interesting data point of where these giant machines are and what they're being used for and what giant means, right? You know, in terms of core, in terms of uh, interconnect, in terms of RAM, um, things like that. And when Brock and I say machine. We're usually talking a cluster of commodity servers of some flavor or another, right? So, yeah. you know, Brock was talking how many we had a, a bazillion cores, but we usually refer to that as one machine because to the user, that's really kind of what it looks like. They submit their job into the machine, and it runs for a while and comes back and gives them their results. Right. I mean, it's, it's all about providing a specific service. I mean, a cluster normally consists of a head node, which will run like some scheduler and batch queue software and some other administrative tasks. Or a bunch uh, of head nodes. Or, yeah, you could have a bunch of head yeah, nodes. See, if you were a better school, node, you would have a bunch of head nodes, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, so we have a head node, and we have a couple of administration nodes that run a couple of auxiliary services. And then the main pieces are, but normally a basic cluster you can get away with a head node, which could also double as a login node, but normally you want your own login node, and then many, many compute nodes. These are the stamp out as many as you can afford, lowest possible cost system. And so this means they have one hard drive. Hard drive blows up, we don't care. We slap a new one in, we re reload the box. Um, normally you don't have redundant power supplies. You don't spend money on that stuff because no node is sacred. You don't care. You reload them. They need to all look the same anyway. And um, that gives us some flexibilities in that really from my point of view we have three or four system images. We have a head node, a login node, and a compute node. Um, so you, really you kind of have these golden images that you have pre preset. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Many of the largest HPC clusters out there don't even have hard drives in the nodes anymore. Yeah. They, it just takes they all power. boot from network. Not just money. Power. I mean, it takes power. Right. Yeah. I mean, my system's relatively small. My data center has a touch screen at the end of it that says how much power I'm drawing to keep that thing going. I was in there, I was a quarter of a megawatt. 250 um, kilowatts was being drawn, and I wasn't even under full load, and the data center is only half full. Wow. And we draw a lot of power. <laughs> I remember uh, a couple years ago, I was down at Sandia National Laboratory, and uh, they had a really big machine at the time. It was called Thunderbird for any of you HPCers out there who remember this kind of stuff. And we were trying to do these top 500 benchmark runs using, uh, I think it was on the order of 
4,500 servers or so. Um, and, and this is a couple years ago, so I won't mention core count because it's kind of different than it was today. But they actually had two power stations on either side of the building to feed the data center. And I remember we had walked out to lunch, so we left the building, and we were just walking back to the building, and I got a, a call on my cell phone from one of the techs who said, yeah, we just had a crash. Um, and so I was talking to him, like, all right, this, do this, do this, all right, now, now run the job again. And I, I heard him click enter on my phone, and then I literally heard and saw both power stations go, boom, 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 just spooling up to feed all the power to those servers, putting them back under load again. It was, it was pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've actually, our last data center, it was constructed in a location based on what the local utility could provide us for power. It well, was like where we could get land and where that was zoned correctly and where there was a megawatt of power coming in. Yeah, which is what... So this kind of see. brings that... Um, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, that's why you see companies like Google and, and Microsoft and, yeah. and Facebook building out in, in Oregon, you know, near hydroelectric stations. You know, they can buy cheap electricity for, for cooling and power. Yeah. A lot of those are all refabbed uh, aluminum factories, and, you know, the the process of refining aluminum uses tons of electricity, so it's a power's already there. Yeah. So this kind of brings the conversation around Chef, which is what you guys approached us to talk about. Um, <laughs> yeah. A few months ago. So what? What? What's, can you talk to us? About what's What's your interest in Chef, or or what would you like to know about it? We have, We have a few experts on the panel. <laughs> so um, I think I'll take that one because I was the one who actually put the call out there. Um, Chef was actually requested by a listener of ours. Um, it was a user request. Um, I had heard of it. There was a lot of places where it was popping up, but other tools, and you can correct me on this to see how they're the same or different, Puppet, B-Config, CF Engine, those tend to be pretty popular in our, in our space, but we do have this problem of I have a 1,000 machines. I want them to all look the same. Um, I want to push a change to them. I want to reload them all from the network because they don't have a hard drive. Uh, I want to do all these things and I have a couple machines that need to look a little different. Um, and so there's, we have this same configuration management problem that any large infrastructure would have. And I want to do it scalably, and I want right. to do it reliably, and I want to have a, a good bus factor too, right? So that if, you know, Brock gets hit by a bus, the next guy can pick it up without having to be a, a freaking genius, right? It might be a grad student. Yeah. I want to manage 10,000 nodes with one guy. Can I do that? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Podcast over. Thanks, guys. Podcast over. Definitely. Ah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if uh, if you got a chance to see maybe some of the talks from our, our conference uh, back in the spring, uh, Facebook gave a talk where they they talked about they've got a staff of six or seven guys. I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but they said you know we've got we support Facebook infrastructure, six or seven guys, and our our you know, our, our rollouts are, you know, we have clusters of 15,000, multiple clusters per data center, multiple data centers per continent, and, you know, and we're on multiple continents. They wouldn't say any numbers, but, you know, this is a staff of, you know, seven or eight supporting that many physical nodes. Um, so Chef is definitely up to the task. What makes Chef different from a lot of the other tools that you mentioned is we push the, the, uh, configuration out to the edge of the nodes. So rather than have, you know, a single server in the middle that's going to calculate everything in advance, you know, and, and sort out the relationship between your 10,000 machines for you, it's going to provide a search engine. It's going to say, hey, you know, you are looking for your cluster head. You know, you're looking for this machine. You're supposed to be a worker node. Here's what you're, you know, and then you come back as the worker node and you say, hey, I'm a worker node. What am I supposed to do? It says, here's your cookbooks. Go configure yourself. It comes back and says, I need to know about that cluster server. The chef server says, oh, a search? Here's your result. Uh, and then that node configures itself, pushes it up to the server, and if somebody needs to talk to that node, they ask the server, where's that guy? There's none of this, you know, uh, I'm building this map of everything in my infrastructure at one time, and I'm keeping that on the server. This, the centralized server is just a search engine. And so it, it's a different... Uh, architecture that allows you to scale a lot better. You know, maybe maybe the psycho computing guys could talk about that. Oh, sure. 
Um, but yeah, we, we, uh, my uh, CEO, Jason Stowe, he sp sp spoke at the ChefConf, and he talked about how we've run clusters as big as 10,000 nodes, uh, in, where Chef is a major component of that. Um, and uh, I, you can do a lot of things with different languages, uh, with different tools like Puppet or CF Engine. Um, but because Chef uses a full-blown programming language that gives you you know, infinite flexibility. You, you have to have that flexibility. It makes all the difference. Um, also, because it's a full-blown programming language rather than a small subset or a small limited language, it's easy for people to build new primitives on top of it. Um, that may make it, does make it more complex to get started with, but it also means that we have a really vibrant ecosystem of components that people are able to build on top of. Um, and that makes a big difference when you have a lot of different systems. Now, in our case of Cycle, we have many different customers, and each has a very different stack. So we will never have three images that can take care of everything. Um, and for us, Chef gives us the flexibility uh, to accommodate all that variance. So OK, so two things. Uh, so you guys, like for cycle-wide, you run one chef instance that you kind of build no. these different customers up on? or No, different uh, different ones for each, one per customer. OK, so there's no actually, and overlap. Often one per, and often one per cluster. It really depends. It depends on the setup. OK, and then so you say this full-blown programming language. What is it? Is it something that like you can just find it's and Ruby. learn? It's, it's Ruby. Ruby. Yeah. So even and, the configuration is written in Ruby. Yeah, so uh, it has a you know a configuration subset of uh, you know a, a DSL built into Ruby for configuration. So you don't have to know everything about Ruby, but if you need to scale out what you're doing, if you need to do something more complex, if you need to access Ruby libraries or you know do something interesting that chances are good you'll need to do, you have a full-blown programming language available to you. Um, and then everything that you do is backed in source control. So, you know, you said, hey, I've got this graduate student. Well, you can probably find somebody who can learn Ruby, uh, and, you know, it's not a, a, an uncommon language. And then everything that they do for deploying your infrastructure is checked in. You know, hopefully uh, you are using, you know, something like Git or Subversion. You're checking in everything, so I can recreate any piece of my infrastructure from source code. So does it understand native package managers and stuff like that? Yes. So Absolutely. it provides a number of, of resources that are abstractions away from the underlying operating system components. So if I'm running, you know, if I need to install a you know, MPI library uh, of a certain version, you know, I just say package MPI library version, you know, 2.1, and then under the covers, Chef knows, oh, I'm on Red I'm on CentOS. You know, I need to use Yum. Uh, I'm on Ubuntu. I need to use apt. Uh, app, you know, and assuming that those packages are available to it, it just goes and handles that. Uh, so your code, be your infrastructure becomes more ag agnostic about what it's actually running on. Yeah. Let, me, let me dive a little more into that. So when you say we're using Ruby, uh, you know, you said it's for the configuration files. But what else? Is there is there an API? Because, I, uh, you know, based on what Brian was saying, he's saying it's kind of infinitely flexible and extendable. So what, what does that yep. mean? So, so the, the server does have an API. Uh, all communications between the client and server are done over uh, HTTP REST interface. Um, and there are, so you can, you can the, the client talks over that API, uh, and then there are client libraries written in Ruby, in uh, Java, in uh, Python, you know, uh, I think there's a .NET one floating around, a PHP one. So you can talk directly to the server to push data in from external sources if necessary, or to query. <clears throat> excuse me, to query it uh, if you need to, you know, manage Chef from another source. Uh, you know, building integrations with other systems is is pretty simple. Uh, when I was talking about the components, I was referring to the DSL that we have for Chef. Uh, that is an easy way to represent common resources. Now, when you're talking about people who don't have much experience, it's really great to present them with kind of a DSL that just matches the problem they're dealing with. For example, I have a, written a, a, a C mount. I call it C, it's like an ESB mount resource that represents 
uh, an MD, an MD, uh, sorry, um, a software RAID on Linux uh, that's stri striped at RAID zero with uh, either XFS or EXT4. Now, to write that kind of code, whether in Ruby or in Bash, would be a ton, but I can represent it with Ruby, specifically with the Chef DSL, with only four lines. I'm easily able to extract out the common case so that someone who has less experience or is less involved with Ruby can easily reuse it. And you see this pattern again and again where people take abstract, very common pattern, and are able to represent it very simply. So uh, you're I'm saying DSL? Um, yeah. What's that DSL? D domain specific language. Okay. That was my question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So we have we have things like file. We have like a file resource. Uh, we have a mount resource. Uh, for every package. or you know, IP tables rules. Yeah, package resource. Like um, interface services, templates. I mean, it, it, oh, most of the things that sysadmins care about. There are already resources built into Chef, and you can add your own as you come up with things that, you know, like Brian said, you find yourself writing a bunch of shell scripts to do something over and over again. You can turn those into reusable resources and build up, you know, libraries of how applications are managed. You know, things that you do as a sysadmin. And when we when we talk about the resources, there are a couple of things that are common across all resources. So, for example, uh, let's take the package resource as an example. So, with a package resource, what you're going to write in your recipe, which is the the thing that you write within Chef, it's your basically your configuration recipe. What you're going to write is a package resource. It'll have the name of the package, and then it will have some attributes about that package, maybe the version number that it's uh, going to be, you know, the version that you need installed and things like that. Underneath that resource, uh, conceptually, underneath that resource is this thing called the provider. And the provider is where all of the heavy lifting happens. The provider knows uh, that I'm running on CentOS or I'm running on uh, Ubuntu. And so I know which package provider I need to go out to and what system calls I need to make to make sure that that package is there. But the other thing that the provider will do is make sure that the resource is in line with the policy. So for example, if you're saying a package, in your recipe, you're essentially saying that that package must be installed. The provider is going to verify that that package is installed and is it the appropriate version. And if it's not, then it will take an action. So it will install that resource. It will install that package so that it does meet the policy. And then you can think of the same thing around, all right, so I've installed a package. Now I need to configure uh, its configuration settings. We have a template resource that will allow you to do that. And so the template resource will specify other attributes like the, the ownership for that uh, template for the file as it gets written on disk, uh, the, the permissions on that file, and then maybe some variable content that goes into that template. And we have a whole series of attributes that you can use uh, to specify you know, in, in various environments or in various roles, you get different values for those attributes. Um, and then, of course, uh, what Chef will do is it will update that template to ensure that it is in line with policy. So with Chef, as you write your recipes, you're really stating the policy. This is what the configuration of the system should look like. And over time, as you execute Chef, your system converges on that policy. All right, another pop-up question. Somebody earlier made reference to cookbooks. What are cookbooks? Sure. So... Basically, what, what a cookbook is is a way to package up a configuration thing. So um, let's t think about uh, you know, a piece of software that you need to have running on your application. So maybe an NPM or a, a, an MPI uh, provider or something like this. Right? A cookbook will include recipes, and the recipes are things like, this is the package that I want installed. These are configuration templates that I want to write out to disk. But then within that cookbook, uh, you will also have some metadata about that recipe or about the cookbook itself. And then the template files that you're going to use to write out to disk. You may have other libraries that are included within the cookbook. So the cookbook is really a, a way to package up a no, a res, one or more recipes and then other files that are uh, required to be used with that configuration thing that you're configuring. So here's a question. Can Is there a way to 
have the client send something to the server saying like, hey, I found, I have a GPU in here. We have machines that have these GPUs for GPU computing and they need extra software installed. And so it can kind of push back like, oh, you have that, you also need this recipe that installs all the NVIDIA drivers. Absolutely. So so when you're writing, when you're writing your recipes, uh, you would say, hey, uh, you can look at yourself you know, you can inspect the node that you're on, and you can say, "Hey, uh, do I have you know this number of cores, or this uh, you know is this installed on my PCI bus? Uh, if so, let's make this other you know set of configuration available to us." That's one of the advantages of of being in Ruby. Um, and then other machines, if if say I'm a job scheduler and I need to you know as send work to some other machines, I can ask the chef server. Hey, I need to find all the other machines that are running that have, uh, you know, this many cores, this amount of memory, and you know, this on their PCI bus, so I can, you know, send them packages. So search is is kind of a, a, an integral part of what Chef does, because you know, the, the example we're usually using is things like, uh, you know, a, a software load balancer searching for the applications it balances, or uh, Hadoop workers looking for their master. Well, you know, in this case, we can say, "Hey, I'm looking for you know things that I'm allowed to work on." Yeah, that sounds a lot like our traditional resource manager. Right. It's like, what what do you have, and what's it currently doing? Uh, it's not as dynamic as a traditional resource manager. It's it's a very nice, very simple interface to deal with the chef search on the server side, but it's not as dynamic. It's um it's only updated after each chef run, successful chef run. Ah, so that's actually a question I wanted to ask is, well, actually, well, how, what do you define as a chef run? Is this something invoked by cron or invoked uh, upon demand or upon reboot or what? when is a chef run? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you can... Here's why I was asking is one of these, you know, blurred lines that I was talking about why people are exploring cloud-based computing is, I want to change my environment basically based on the user or group of the user. And like when this user is using this node, I need these 16 extra libraries. And I don't want to put them on the network file system because that's just traffic then that I got to deal with. I'd rather stage it locally on those nodes or do something because that user is now running on that node. And when that user is done, I want to take that off or do, do some other kind of configuration action. Right. So, so the chef client, uh, you can trigger it. You can put it in cron. Uh, you can run it as a daemon where it checks in, you know, every ten minutes or whatever. Uh, you can run it on demand. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> SSH where we can push, and there are integrations with lots of other systems. Uh, and we have our own that's coming soon that does zero MQ, so we can send you know two thousand machines at a time. Hey, everyone, run your chef client now uh, and, and grab the latest pieces. Um, but one of the things you kind of uh, mentioned is taking a machine and repurposing it. That's that's a little bit of a different use case. Um, typically, we, we t tend to push people towards thinking of the machines as ephemeral. So I might have a big beefy box, and I run a workload on it, and when I'm done, I want to recycle that box. I don't want to uninstall and reconfigure it for the next guy because maybe you know they trashed temp and I didn't notice that they filled the disk. You know, Chef's not going to, unless you tell Chef to clean up after itself, it's not going to clean up after the previous person. So, you know, typically you want to just recycle boxes as you as you use them. So as the next guy comes on, he's guaranteed a fresh box, uh, which is kind of interesting. I uh, I do a lot of OpenStack stuff, and I see OpenStack is picking up a lot of traction and and HPC, especially using like the uh, the bare metal. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the bare metal driver for the uh, the scheduler for uh, for Nova, whereas instead of using virtualization, you actually have physical machines that map to uh, an image type. So I say, hey, I need ten boxes, you know, triple XL boxes, and those are available to me, and it puts a fresh installation of whatever operating system. <coughs> You're having a tough time. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Don't you uh, take, take, take a break. You're like getting second. all choked up. This is really exciting. <laughs> oh, I love right? this stuff. No, but but uh, I I think I you know I expect to see a lot of OpenStack showing up in HPC environments really soon, uh, because you get your quotas, you get access to bare metal, um, you can manage all your resources and recycle them automatically. You know, 
and, and put them all behind an API. Yeah, That's awesome, we actually, man. I was totally unaware of that. that the bare yeah. metal drive, I didn't know it existed. Yeah. It's, it's already the case that the scheduler we use for our local resource called um, Moab, um, from adaptive computing, I already keeps track of like what OS it is and like image type, and you can actually request that when you submit your job. And this is actually how they do their like dynamic. You have one scheduler that runs both a Linux and a Windows cluster simultaneously, and they like reload them dynamically. But they rely on some third-party tool like Chef to do that. Um, and so it could just be like, okay, these four machines are idle, and they would fit. It could just send a thing to Chef saying like, hey, make those Windows machines. Yeah. Would that work? Um, we would tell OpenStack to make those Windows machines, or you know, tell some other provisioning tool. Chef doesn't manage. Chef isn't a provisioner. Uh, it takes over after the OS is on the box. Okay. Um, but you know, we've integrated with just about every provisioning tool out there, uh, so you know, it's easy enough to do. Yeah, there's a, um, a system that uh, a new extension to the Chef server that should be coming out open source any day now. So I hear <laughs> that. <laughs> I you think, there? and it's uh, so I, I great can't, you can't talk it, about it. Yeah, it can't, uh, you know, from the Opsco guys, I, I hear it's coming, and I and I really push them because it can't come out soon enough. So you, Brian, you, I think we you missed, got broken uh, up half right of the description. Ah. There. You, you cut out in the middle. I said uh, that there's this new component coming out from uh, for the Chef server, and uh, it just it, it can't come out soon enough because it would be very instrumental for this kind of dynamic reallocation of uh, services. It wouldn't be a, an engine for driving the rules, but it would certainly be an, have, has a much better uh, make a channel for communicate, communicating with your different nodes in a real-time basis and discovering what what uh, what resources they have. Okay, so let me let me ask a hypothetical question. You guys, being chef experts, if I wanted to reload ten thousand nodes all at once. How would I set up a chef infrastructure and assume a Red Hat CentOS environment because that appears to be most popular in our in our space? Um, how would I set up an environment to take bare metal and make sure that they are configured the way I want as quickly as possible? So, so in the HPC space, there are lots of tools that do hardware provisioning. You know, like Rockbox or uh, that's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Um, but things like Xcat, Razor. Uh, um, we use this Kickstart. Cobbler, yeah. So, so Kickstart or a Precede put the OS on there, but there are there are applications that manage that Pixie booting lifecycle. Yeah. Um, and and so Chef ha people have integrated Chef to those things where after they put the OS on the box, there's usually like a a late command, um, and it says put the Chef client on this box, and then that box when it boots up checks into the Chef server and says you know reporting for duty. Uh, what am I supposed to do? And you can pass in a run list when that machine is provisioned. So you can say, hey, go get me a CentOS, you know, triple XL image with, you know, 64 gigs of RAM. And when it's done, I want it to be running this work, work stack. And so it will go provision the OS, you know, bare metal, pixie boot, provision the OS, put chef on the box, check in with the chef server, says, somebody told me I'm supposed to be running this. And then the chef server says, here are your cookbooks, configure yourself, check back when you're done. And then it joins whatever sort of cluster uh, is out there. And so that's actually a pretty common workflow around uh, you know, bare metal provisioning. So is the chef server going to be the one handing out the packages that it wants installed after the initial Kickstarter? Or does it still just use Yum and Yum uses HTTP or wherever you have those repositories? Yeah, so, so Chef is not the repository for your packages. It holds your cookbooks. The, the Chef server is holding your cookbooks, uh, which are just the, the recipes for how to set up these applications. You can still use you know, apt repos, yum repos, local mirrors, remote mirrors, whatever you need to do. Chef's not going to you know, do that for you, but it's flexible to the point where you, know, you can have whatever mirrors you, know, you need to get your applications on your boxes. Right, so and for a lot like of people do is they the... will have, a, for the sake of scalability, have their own mirrors on uh, something like S3 uh, or even Amazon CloudFront, so that they're 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 pretty much guaranteed that uh, uh, that the, the, whatever provides their their packages won't break down in the middle of a big run. So it sounds like one of the secrets to your scalability is that Chef is really. Uh, very crassly speaking, a, a metadata server, right? Yes. That it's just saying what to do. 
it's not providing the actual stuff, like the packages which consume all the bandwidth and things like that. And Correct. that's how you can scale out to like 10,000 servers and whatnot? Is that Absolutely. It? Yeah, I okay. mean, the, you know, it's kind of the... Uh, the use of search is, you know, we, we give the analogy of, you know, when the internet started, you had Yahoo who tried to provide a, a directory of everything on the internet. And then you had people like AltaVista came and said, you know, forget that, here's search, go find what you're looking for. Um, and that's kind of, you know, Chef's approach is, you know, we're, we can't hold everything for you, but uh, we can provide, you know, we can index as much as the data as possible with search. You know, where you get their packages from, local mirror, S3, that's not Chef's, you know, expertise. Okay, so, like, if, if I were to install Chef, I would still need to set up my own LDAP server, my own Pixie Boot server, my own whatever server and things like that. Yep. And Chef is the traffic cop that says, oh, you Node 37 that just came up. By the way, set yourself up to talk to that LDAP server over there. Exactly. Set yourself up to talk to yep. that evil NFS server yep. and, 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 and so on, and right? Yes, and you have cookbooks that have set up your LDAP server. Register yeah. that box with the chef server so the guy who says, yeah. I need to log into LDAP, where is that? You, know, you don't have to know these things in advance. Your machines, you know, and, and then if that LDAP server goes down, you redeploy it on some other machine without having to care you know, without having a big spreadsheet of IP addresses, where you're like, oh, LDAP's now over here, you know, update all the configs. You know, those configs are ge dynamically generated. Oh, I think I finally get it. <laughs> <laughs> Light bulb. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, because traditionally what we'd have is, is like on our configuration management thing, we'd have a config file that would have, you know, the server name hard-coded in there. And you're just saying that you can refer to that resource that Chef keeps track of what box currently has it. Yes. So it really doesn't care. So this right. works totally great in like the Amazon EC2 type world where you really don't know what they're going to give you. It's yeah. just you just have something reporting back saying, "Hey, I'm yours. Yeah. Do something with me." Or, or if you, you know, if you have a, a data center that you're, you know, frequently recycling, you know, the machines, you know, you're putting different workloads on them, you don't have to care about the previous tenant. You know, you blast them and say, here's 100 boxes, go to town. So can I steer stuff a little bit, though? Like, you know, I said, our head nodes generally they do have mirrored hard drives um, because it is a critical piece of infrastructure. Uh, compute nodes don't. Like, is that one of those things that I can kind of tell it? Like, find a box that has two drives? That, that's more of your provisioning tool. Okay. You know, so, so when you say, you know, when you go to... Uh, you know your API for your hardware. You say, hey, I need this. I need a you know a box that is this size, and when it reports back, go and uh, uh, put the the you know go put this run list on it. This is a a a uh, cluster controller node. So I can see it as being extremely useful for the extreme large scale. What what would you recommend to somebody who's actually got a relatively small infrastructure, say 32 nodes or less? Is Chef something you just they described use? our infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, Opscode's internal OpenStack deployment is currently 25 nodes, um, and we run about 300 VMs on it. Um, so that's you know that's kind of our use case. And of course, you know we're going to use Chef for everything. My my own lab that I do a lot of OpenStack deployment on is only four boxes right now. Uh, I lost another yesterday, um, but you know pretty much. I'm always destroying my hardware and recycling it, uh, and so I, I use Chef because I don't want to have to manually configure anything. I can, you know, Pixie boot these machines in, in five minutes, and you know they're up and running. You know, Ubuntu 13.04 with whatever I need, or they're running RHEL, or you know, it's it's easy to recycle my hardware. And I would say anything larger than zero machines is a good candidate, right? I mean, even if you just have one machine, you know, if you're you have your your cookbooks and they're in you know the cookbooks are backed up somewhere if that machine gets hit by a meteor you get your replacement and you restore from the cookbooks and you don't have to sit you know spend that first day getting everything tweaked just the way you wanted it again I have a great example of this and that is um, we run uh, our own git repository using the GitLab software which is an excellent uh, tool to manage your git repository and I have a set of cookbooks that I use to set up uh, GitLab uh, it, it looks just like GitHub. Now, when it comes time to upgrade 
GitLab, uh, I will use that cookbook to set up a new server uh, and migrate everything over. Um, and the migration process will be a million times simpler because I have, uh, I have, you know, I have basically have the, the configuration in code for this very critical service. Now you mentioned the, the learning curve, and you were just kind of emphasizing that again by writing code. So it's kind of prerequisite for this that you need to be able to read or at least uh, tangentially rock Ruby code? Not really. I mean, if you can write Bash, you, you'll probably be fine with, uh, with Chef. Oh, how... Um, I, that confused me a little bit, because you were saying before that Ruby was the language of Chef. So where does if you Bash... Can, if, you can, if you can grok simple shell scripts, you, I, you'll be able to grok understand the, uh, the the chef configuration language okay and we have lots of you know resources for new users uh, you start at learnchef.com 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 all right guys. all uh, right the conversation Brian uh, you got cut off again but I know what you were trying to say <laughs> was we're reaching the end of our time together for today. <laughs> Uh, so any any last thoughts or questions before we start to wrap up for the day? No, nah, just like I say, thank you for doing this uh, joint show. It seems like you know we answered your questions and you answered ours, so this is gonna be pretty good. I think our our listeners and hopefully you know some of them will find out about Chef. Yeah, I certainly learned a lot about HPC today, so I thought it was uh, I thought it was just a great conversation. Yep. Well, so with that, why don't we move into the picks? So this is the point in our show where we uh, allow each one of our panelists a moment to share something that they'd like to with our audience, whether it's uh, technical or not, doesn't matter. Um, can be technical, a book, a beer, whatever you like. Uh, Brock, I know you have prepared some picks, so I'm going to go with you first. Uh, so I had two different things. Um, one is I have been for about the last three years now really enjoying um, a website called MarginalRevolution.com, which is actually a blog of two econ professors at George Mason University. But the one guy's a foodie, um, very non-argumentative, unlike some of the econ blogs out there about policy and things like that. And I've so it's like it's food, it's weird things that people actually sell in other countries. It's current policy, or, you know, in places like Greece and stuff like that. And it's, it's really been an interesting read of a condensed kind of view, and I really like the way they present it. Uh, the other thing I had, I actually need to go grab it, just a sec, because I knew I would be bouncing the entire time, is I use standing desks. For those who can't uh, or are listening, Brock is about to go get his... <laughs> I had a back problem. Hey, me too. Standing desk, but the other thing I do when I can't stand anymore is I sit on a yoga ball. <laughs> and this actually helps me quite a bit with um, my lower back problem. And but I know I couldn't sit on this during the show because I would just be sitting here, bouncing around like a hippity hop, like when I was like five years old. <laughs> Don't let it stop you. Don't let it stop you. <laughs> Matt, but Matt, it, Matt often joins from a, a very special t type of desk. Also, Matt, you can tell us about that. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, are you are you done, Brock? I'll go ahead. And yeah, go ahead. <laughs> segue into my picks. So uh, I had uh, back surgery two months ago, um, but uh, I have a treadmill desk, and uh, I've been on Food Fight a few times walking on that. Uh, mm -hmm. The setup that I have is from uh, if you go to treadmilldeskdiary.com, I pretty much have his setup. It's a, a really cheap IKEA desk on top of a, a cheap treadmill, um, and so I usually walk you know an hour or two a day. Uh, and it helps my back. I'm um, doing much better. Uh, so that's, I guess that's my pick, treadmilldeskdiary.com. And uh, my other pick is uh, a music pick. Uh, there was a, a 2007 movie called Sunshine. Uh, Danny Boyle, the director of Slumdog Millionaire, uh, 28 Days Later. Uh, really interesting, good sci-fi movie. Um, but the soundtrack uh, is really hard to track down. It's only on iTunes. Uh, no DVDs or no CDs of it. Uh, but uh, it's been popping up in a lot of commercials lately, and I couldn't place my finger on where I'd been hearing it. So uh, go check that out. It's really, really good. Um, a combination of uh, classical music and uh, some of the guys from Underworld. Oh, awesome. Um. Uh Jeff, how about you for some picks? All right, um, I got uh, I got two. Uh, so one I've been playing with recently is uh, a friend of mine 
when the Raspberry Pis came out, I was like, wow, those are kind of cool, but I can't think of a reason of why I would want one. Hmm. And I was talking to a friend of mine about it, and he said, you're an idiot. It's 25 bucks. Buy one, and then you'll figure out what you want to do with it. I was like, <laughs> okay, that's a good point. So I bought one, and um, the, the idea that I came up with was I have one of those Nest thermostats in my home uh, that, you know, it, it has a, a nice motion sensor and has a nice interface. It's, it's spouse-friendly. Right, and uh, it programs itself well and things like that. But one of the things that's a bummer for me is that this Nest thermostat is actually in a room. It's in our dining room, and we don't walk through there very often. So the motion sensor bit really doesn't work very well for us. And a couple of times it's done a false positive of, you know, it thinks that I'm not home even though I am home. And so how this all ties together is that somebody wrote nest.py, a little Python script, that will go talk to your nest and it can query it and get all the information and it can also set oh I'm home or I'm away or I can set certain temperatures or you know all the all the stuff that you can do on the normal nest interface and um, so I wrote a little a little program that's actually up on GitHub it's called Ruby Slippers and <laughs> it's probably a, a incredibly poorly chosen name because it has nothing to do with Ruby it has everything to do with there's no place like home um, and basically all it does is it monitors for my iPhone. So if I'm at home and my iPhone is talking on the network, it's like, oh, he's home. And it makes sure that my Nest is set as home. And vice versa, when it doesn't see my iPhone, it sets my Nest as away. So it's kind of my replacement for uh, the, the motion sensor. And it's kind of just been fun, a little recreational coding on the weekends and nights and things like that to, uh, to get that going. And along the same token, um, Probably because I work for Cisco, uh, the network that I have in my home is probably a little more complicated than what you find in most people's homes. And um, I have a I have a variety of Cisco gear in my house because you know everybody needs a Catalyst router in their house to do the complicated L3 forwarding that you need to do. Um, but recently, and this is going to sound like a plug, but it, I don't mean it as a plug. We bought this company called Meraki about a year ago or so, and they have an incredibly slick interface for managing um, switches and WAPs. They have this really nice web cloud-based interface, and uh, I just bought a bunch of Meraki gear that's supposed to arrive later today, and that's what I'm going to be playing with that stuff all weekend, uh, setting it up and configuring it and seeing what the power of it is. It actually brings network management down to a much simpler level, so you don't have to be an iOS expert or an NXOS expert or or things like that, and so it's going to be going to be kind of fun to play with that. And yes, I am totally a geek, and I love this stuff. <laughs> awesome, Ben. How about you? Okay, so, so my first pick, I'm going to throw out the Lisa conference hosted by Usenix. It's uh, November 3rd through 8th in Washington D.C. It's the uh, Large Installation System Administration Conference, and there's a lot of really sharp sysadmin types there every year some great trainings and technical sessions and a lot of uh, hallway track and beer. Yeah, I'll be doing a, uh, a full day intro to Chef during Lisa. So I if will you want to learn, learn more about Chef, come join me. <laughs> I will be writing that up for the blog team actually, so I guess we'll see you there. All right. <laughs> and then for my second pick, I'll go ahead and throw out today's Google Doodle, which is the uh, pinata game if you haven't played it yet. Um, if you're listening on the audio later, then you know, go back and find it. But I've managed to waste several hours of my company's time by sharing it with my colleagues this morning. So, yeah, you really killed the productivity this morning. I do what I can. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Anything else, Ben? That's about it. Cool. Um, for my picks, I want to pick uh, one of our former guests. That is Matt Wise, who came on the show uh, to talk about Zookeeper. Um, uh, I've been working a lot with Zookeeper, and uh, he's re recently given me some great tips, specifically on how to use S-Tunnel uh, to encrypt connections between clients and the Zookeeper ensemble, because Zookeeper doesn't actually have a security model when it comes down to it. And uh, for that, next I want to pick a music pick, and that is the band called Churches with a V. Those are my picks. Awesome. I'm going to follow up your pick, uh, your music pick, with another music pick. Uh, and this is one that's been going around the office at Opscode a lot lately. It's a band called Unlocking the Truth. Uh, now, if you haven't seen or heard of this band, it is a sixth grade metal band. And 
They <laughs> are incredible. If you listen to the music, now that I've told you that they're a sixth grade metal band, you'll know that they're a sixth grade metal band. But if you just listen to the music and you didn't know that, you would have no idea. Uh, these kids are absolutely incredible. Absolutely wild. Uh, and then for my second pick... Um, <laughs> it's a metal Hanson. It, it's... <laughs> It's more like a metal crisscross. Uh, so <laughs> I've just dropped a link into the uh, into the chat window. So th- those of you that are watching are gonna maybe I'll drop a link in uh, IRC also. Show notes. Yeah. But yeah, and definitely in the show notes. Uh, but check that out. But um, so while we're talking about children, today is my daughter Shannon's so actually, birthday. Actually, can so. I ask what what oh. truth are they unlocking? Yeah. Uh, like you, multiplication you, table. I mean, go and watch watch the video, and you will see. It's right. uh, it's it's pretty All awesome. Right. It's pretty awesome. Uh, I will say that the first comment on the video that I just posted is from a guy named David, and his comment is: "Today's lesson: be a bully and wind up homeless. Do not mess with metal." Uh, and he goes on to say a couple other things. But so that's the that's the truth that they're unlocking, I suppose. <laughs> wow. Uh, I t- yeah. It auto completed that in Google search for me. So there you go. Awesome. It's it's good stuff. Yeah, and my second pick, uh, I started to say this, it's my daughter Shannon. It's her seventh birthday today, so I just want to wish Shannon a happy birthday. Happy birthday, happy Shannon. Birthday. Happy All birthday, right. Shannon. Happy All right. birthday, Shannon. Thanks so much, everyone. And if you're listening on the on the uh, YouTube stream, if you want to wish my daughter a happy birthday, I'm sure she would appreciate it. In any case, uh, that brings us to the end of another awesome episode of the Food Fight Show. Uh, I learned a lot about HPC. I hope you guys learned a little bit about Chef. Um, and, yeah, this has been great. <clears throat> so, uh, listeners of the Food Fight Show, thanks again for tuning in. Be sure to tell your friends about us. You can find more information on foodfightshow.org. Where can we find more information about the RCE podcast? Uh, RCE, the best place is rce-cast.com. Um, all the entire back catalogs there. We don't care. Excellent, excellent. Yep, we have all of our uh, episodes there on the foodfightshow.org as well. Uh, Brock, Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been great to have you. And Ben and Matt, thanks for joining thanks for us having as well. Us. Yeah. Thanks. thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Well, until next time, chefs, keep it hot. Keep it hot. Thank you.